Okay, we're going to do a talk on error handling, so with a uh, bottle of beer, because what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as uh, Cal said, it's going to Phil Nash. In the work of JetBrains, you can't see the little logo up there, there's a bigger one here. Obviously, we're in the JetBrains event space here. I'm here for the week because uh, my, my team, the Dev Advocacy team, uh, all work remotely, so once a year around this time we, we get together for some team meetings. And, uh, I'm taking a, uh, some valuable uh, drinking time off tonight uh, from the team to talk to you here, so thank you all for coming. And my role at JetBrains, um, I work with the, all the C++ tools uh, that we currently have. That's uh, CLine, App Code, and ReSharp C++. I'm not going to be talking about them um, in this talk tonight, but if you do want to talk to me about that, I'll be quite happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, that's, that's my role after all. But for tonight, we're going to look into this subject. As I said already, it's about error handling. Hopefully that was obvious from the title. Uh, the title is obviously uh, a bit of a play on words. And you may recognize, or at least guess, what this background image is all about. This is from the uh, NASA Control Center uh, sometime in the early 70s, I think. Um, during the Apollo 13 mission. And some of you may have seen the, the film they made of that mission in the 90s. And as part of my preparation for this talk, I had to go and watch that film, of course. Uh, it's a great film, actually. If you haven't seen it for a while, you haven't seen it at all, do go and watch it. And it's all about the, uh, see, the, the mission, manned mission to the moon, which went wrong uh, halfway around. So they never actually got there uh, to abort and then try to do an early return. See what I did there. Um, that, that's not the reason I, I chose this, though. In the film, during the, the famous oxygen, oxygen tank crisis that, that caused it all, uh, flight director Gene Krantz, pictured here, uh, said the words, failure is not an option. And that's where that phrase comes from, from the film. He never actually said it in real life, and it's not up until that point. Uh, he's now uh, named his autobiography after it, so in a way he's said it now. So, Failure is not an option is the, the expression we're familiar with. <coughs> and I, I reversed it. Um, two reasons. Uh, one, because it's, it's a great pun. Oh yeah, talk about puns. <laughs> a little side story here. I'm, I'm known for my puns, um, particularly among my team. And uh, we, we have our own um, team Slack channel on the company Slack. And any time I make a pun on the channel, they've actually got a, a Slack sticker with my face on it that they, they put, put against it. And for the team meetings this week, they actually printed out the same sticker. So every time I make a pun, they put a sticker on me. So, so that's, that's where the title comes from. But obviously, talking about error handling, uh, in C++, we now have the, the optional type that's often used in that role. And we're going to get onto that. That's actually just a small part of what we're going to talk about. It's really going to be sort of the past, present, and future of error handling. Do a bit of a tour of it and way up all the ins and outs. So let's get into that, and I want to make a start it's by looking at what an error actually is. What, what do we mean when we talk about error, just so we're all on the same page here. Um, and we could just say very vaguely, <coughs> it's, it's what happens when something went wrong. And the reason I've got this up here is because this is actually part of a, a slightly bigger image I got off uh, Twitter some time ago. So this is, if I zoom in a little bit more, an error message that someone got, got back in their banking app on, a, on their phone. This is not the sort of thing that uh, the average user really wants to see. Now, as technical people, we can look at this, we can probably guess there's some sort of job back end there. And, uh, yeah, we can make a good, good guess at it. But what is the everyday person going to make of a message like this? And in fact, we don't have to wonder too much, because the person that posted this on Twitter had their own guess. I don't, I'm pretty sure this is tongue-in-cheek. I really love what they said. I'll just let you read that. Um, sorry if you can't read it. <laughs> so, this talk is not about drafting the error. Uh, that's, that's beyond the, uh, the scope of this talk. But I thought it's a nice way to get us warmed up. And actually, thinking about that, um, you know, sometimes errors that occur, they do become visible to our end users. Uh, and hopefully to us during development and debug. But often not. And sometimes these things go un undiscovered for a long time, and maybe they're, um, they're there, but they're just sort of lurking. And it almost feels like we've got away with it, these sort of uh, hidden uh, bugs or errors. But we know 
from our one experience that these are the worst types of errors because, of, because we, we don't find them during development. Because it's usually our users that find them out in the field and we can't reproduce them, we can't work out what's going on. Um, that can really be a big problem and often cause a lot of damage as well because we don't know exactly what they're going to do. So they're the ones which we want to try and get to, get to first. And often it's because we haven't got a good error handling <coughs> strategy for these things creeping. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But we're going to also define some my terms. So we're familiar with the term the happy path. So when a possible error condition occurs, if it doesn't occur, then we'll obviously take the happy path after that. But it sort of raises a question, what do we call the opposite of the happy path? And it's not something we usually talk about quite so much. And in fact, if you, if you just ask someone directly, what's the opposite of the happy path? They'll probably say, so like the sad path. <laughs> it's sort of seems natural, but actually in practice, it doesn't, it's not really a good fit. We wouldn't really use this term in our code usually. Um, and I did a little bit of research on this, and there doesn't seem to be much of a consensus. Uh, I did find a tweet from uh, Ron Jeffries, uh, big in the Agile world, asking the same question. Uh, got loads of different responses. Um, suggested some of his own as well, particularly like uh, the veil of tears, half of sorrow. Um, none of them particularly the practical though. So what I just ended up settling on is the error path. A bit boring, but you know, it, I think it's fairly understandable to represent what we're talking about. So we're going to talk about the happy path and the error path. There's lots of different types of errors that we might actually come into contact with. Um, and one of those different types, there are different ways that we'll, we'll need to classify and deal with it. So I think it's worth taking a moment to do that as well. And I want to start with one that I'm sure we're all very familiar with. And I'm sure you've, you've written a message like this before. And I'm sure our users have seen it as well. Because things that should never happen, I mean, they still do a lot of the time. So we need some strategy for handling that case. We can't just assume it will never happen. We need some way of dealing with it. So that's the first category. Of it. And it, this amazing moment of irony, when I was first hearing these slides, slides uh, Kino actually crashed on me and gave me the stack number, which I, I don't think was supposed to have happened. And I, I really like the, uh, the exception though, XC Corpus Notify, <laughs> which you often see in these Mac uh, stack dumps. Um, reminds me of that uh, error message I saw earlier. Not really the sort of thing that you want end users to be thinking about. But there's, there's three categories I want to look at. So it should never happen is one of them. It shouldn't usually happen. Um, it's a little bit vaguely worded, but we'll look at an example at the moment of what I really mean by that and why I wanted to call this one out. And then probably the most common case is the that might happen, but we would prefer if we didn't. And as we'll see, this is what we spend most of the time on. These are the things that um, we, we consider them errors when they occur, but they're you know, predictable. They're, they're things that you expect. We expect to happen sometimes. So let's have a look at some of the examples. So that it should never happen. Things like null dereference, out of range, use after free. So you can think of plenty more examples. You know, but they really, really shouldn't happen. If they do, they represent bugs in your code. It's as simple as that. Uh, which is why you know, sometimes they do happen, because we do have bugs. We still need to deal with it. It shouldn't usually happen. There's two or three things we could put here, but if one really stands out, it's sort of a poster child for this one, and that's out of heat memory, new or man of failed. Um, and I think it shouldn't usually happen. It is something that obviously can happen, and you know, we need to be prepared for that, but it, it could happen pretty much anywhere in the code. And uh, guarding against it is incredibly difficult. And most code bases don't um, correctly handle an out of memory condition. So it really is a special case of something that almost never happens, and when it does, we don't handle it anyway. So we'll look a little bit more about how we're going to handle that in a moment. So then there might happen for a good, few simple examples, I'm sure you can think of a whole long list more, because most, of, most things fall into this bucket, but couldn't file not found, couldn't convert from string, couldn't find a key in that, that sort of thing. Now we can divide these things up in other different ways. Um, so I said that it should never happen category represent bugs in your code. And another way of saying that is it's a logic error. And if it's not a logic error, then it's a, it must be coming from I.O. or side effects. If you think about it, that's logical because 
Either the error occurs from something in the code or from outside the code. Only really, only all two options. But there's a couple of little wrinkles on this. The first one is that those examples I gave at the bottom, but sometimes they're actually logic errors, depending on the context that they're occurring. You know, maybe that file really should be there. That string really should encode an integer and that, that key really should be in the map. And if not, then it's a bug somewhere else in the code. So you've got code that actually relies on that being the case. So this is actually context dependent down here. So sometimes we do need to deal with it as a logic error. And there's a little bit of a problem there because often we build our error handling strategy into the implementation code. When it's actually the context of the calling code, we need to make a decision about what type of error it is. So that can be a problem. We'll look at how we might try to unify that. And then the other wrinkle is that middle one that I mentioned, the outer feed memory. As I said, this almost never happens in most code bases. Uh, and if you're saying, oh yeah, I have to deal with that all the time, we well, want a special case. There are some special cases that have to deal with this correctly all of the time. Um, you know, we know about those, but for most code bases, we don't even have to think about this. And yet, so much of our code is there to guard against exceptions, where well, the only exception likely is out of memory. Think about that for a moment. We write lots of code to guard against something that probably almost never happens, and we don't handle it correctly anyway. Uh, Herb Sutter said recently, if you see some bad alloc in your code, you're not handling out of memory correctly. Think about that for a moment. So, we're going to treat that separately. At the moment, if uh, a call to new fails, by default, if you're not calling the, um, uh, the no throw version of new, it throws an exception. But it does that because it's calling an except a, uh, a new handler whose behavior is to throw an exception. You can't allocate the memory. We can change that. In fact, we can not only change that in our code, but we, we can potentially change it in the standard. And this is a discussion that's actually going on at the moment. Definitely not going to be in 20. Maybe it'll never happen. <coughs> but if it does, it means that maybe we can rely on calls to new never throwing, at least by default. That's interesting. For most code bases, they may be better off because of that. It's an interesting thought. The other way we can divide these back <coughs> is to say that the I.O. errors, these ones down the bottom, potentially including out of memory, depending on your, your code base, are recoverable errors in that the error, uh, uh, the error condition occurs, we can actually carry on. We might just take a different path with the code, but everything's still good. Whereas the top type of errors, the logic errors, the bugs, if one of those errors occurs, really all bets are off. We are well into undefined behavior land here, and very bad things can happen. And that sounds obvious, but a lot of the time we try to handle this with control flow. So what we tried to do that thing didn't happen because of some logic error that we, we were sure couldn't have happened. Something happened that we knew couldn't have happened, we are going to carry on anyway because we've got this you know, highly fault tolerance in the system. The problem is that's likely to do more damage than the, the error itself. And obviously you, know, you know, have to make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would argue that if you really are working in a system where you, you can't allow your process to go down because of a, a bug, probably want to be writing sort of in a small processes in a Erlang style where they can you have know, a watchdog that's going to relaunch it if it goes down and everything just carries on. Maybe microservices, something like that. But there are ways to deal with that that don't allow you to continue if you detect that a bug has occurred. Or look at error. Now we can also say that we can handle those types of errors using contracts. Then the standard that we have today, C++ standard we have today, the only thing we have that looks like a contract is assert. So we can, we can assert certain things, our preconditions, let's use it for postconditions, um, and invariants. We can use assert for all of those. It sort of works. Um, it's a bit of a blunt instrument, um, but it's in the right space. We should definitely be using more asserts. We can also roll our own more sort of fully fledged contract system. Some people have. Uh, Bloomberg is a particularly good example here. 
and they've, they've really done a lot of thinking in this space. Um, but there's also a um, stands proposal that I'll touch on a little bit more in a moment uh, for that. Um, One question? Yes. Are we talking about the static contracts or dynamic contracts? So the question is, uh, are we talking about static contracts or dynamic contracts? Um, I'm particularly talking here about static contracts, uh, sorry, dynamic contracts, um, like a cert. But I believe, and I know there was some backwards and forwards on this, I'm not sure what the final result is, that the, in the, the standards proposal, there is at least an allowance for it to be visible to the compiler, for the compiler to be able to potentially enforce some things as well. But that may not have actually worked out in the end, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I won't say any more about that, so I don't know. But definitely dynamic contracts when I'm talking about here. Um, as I said before, with out of heap memory, we may actually deal with that just by terminating. Because we could just say, well, you know, we haven't um, written our code to, to deal with that. That's actually not really that different to, uh, say, out of stack space. Go stack overflow, because you usually just terminate. We, we, we look at that because we, we generally just try to avoid that happening in the first place. Um, but we can also handle it using error returns. Currently, we also throw exceptions. That may change. And then the bottom um, category, we currently deal with using exceptions and error codes. And this is the area we're going to look at uh, in a bit more detail. So let's carry on. So I'll, I'll come back to the contract. This is the, the standards proposal that's going through at the moment. Uh, I believe, not the last standards meeting, the one before that, around as well, this was approved to be merged into the standard C20. And in San Diego, it's discussed a bit more and some more details came out. So it's still in active discussion, so it's definitely going to be in 20 in some form. So there we go. But we're going to talk about recoverable errors. This, I think, is where most of the really interesting stuff's going on. Um, although, just rewinding a moment, talking about contracts again, um, there is actually another category of errors that we currently deal with using. Uh, by, by throwing a std logic error. And it's also been said, um, notably by Herb Sutter, that std logic error is itself a logic error. Because <laughs> you've got a logic error, it represents a bug in your code, we shouldn't be trying to deal with that in a recoverable way. And therefore, it really belongs um, in the realm of contracts. So there's also a push to move things in the standard more in the way of the contracts instead of throwing std logic error. So that's another change that we may see in the future. And certainly in our own code, we shouldn't be throwing a sub logic error. Uh, we should be using asserts or contracts. So, recoverable errors. Um, I said that these are uh, error returns or other ways of passing error codes or exceptions. And there's also different um, trade-offs we can make between the different approaches that we can, we can deal with here. Um, we're used to maybe thinking about one or two of those at a time and then making like a blanket decision about oh, we're going to use all exceptions in this code base or we're only going to use error codes. Um, or sometimes we'll use a mix, but I think there's actually quite a few different dimensions that we can consider. And that actually may give us a, a, a better picture, first of all, as to what we should be using now, but also what we, what we can do better. Where are the weaknesses in these? What can we build on? So what we're going to do is we introduce this scorecard for some examples and keep track of uh, the, these various metrics, um, starting with the overhead incurred by the use of the error handling, um, as opposed to the most optimal thing you could, you could possibly do by hand. Um, so the numbering I'm using from 1 to 10, 10 means good, 1 means bad, and all the numbers in between. So some of them are sort of worded in reverse, so when I talk about overhead, a high number means it's, it's good, low overhead. So apologies for that. There were, there were too many of these for me to go back and change these. We actually want to talk about, separately, the overhead on the happy path and on the error path. Because often they're very different, um, and that can make a difference in, in terms of what is applicable. We also want to look at the safety in terms of uh, how hard something is to use, how, how easy it is to misuse. Because if you do your error handling wrong, obviously it can be quite big trouble. Um, 
The amount of noise it introduces into your code. Some forms of error handling can be very noisy. Uh, we'll see just how noisy in a moment. And closely related to that, I call some a separate part. So what I mean by this is separation of the happy path from the error path. So write all your happy path out as if no errors occurred and collect all the errors up somewhere else. That's the separation of paths. Then reasonability. How easy it is to reason about the error handling as well as code with and without the errors. And we'll dig into what that means a little bit more as we go through. And composability. This is two things really. This is how easy it is to uh, compose the error handling itself. So if you've got multiple levels of it, you know, how well do they compose? But also the composability of the code apart from the error handling. Can you compose functions together? Does the error handling get in the way? That sort of thing. And finally, message. Just means what extra information can we provide along with the error? The context in which it occurred. What actually went wrong? As opposed to just something went wrong. Now, there are other metrics we could consider. Last time I gave a talk like this, um, someone did suggest another one, but I thought it was a really good idea. Unfortunately, I didn't make a note of it, so I can't remember what it was now. But the, there are others. Uh, I think this is sufficient to, um, to make the points I want to make towards the end. And the other thing I should add with the numbers that I'm going to come up with, the very finger in the air, you may disagree with the actual numbers. Hopefully, you'll agree with the overall shape of them. That's the important thing. And sort of the general trade off for me. Don't get too hung up on the specifics. So, Let's start by looking at error codes. It's probably the most uh, widespread form of error handling across uh, multiple languages. And starting with something that looks sort of very uh, C-like, although we're using C++ types. And the, the example I'm going to use for the first few um, is this function where we're going to create a directory in the file system. So we'll take a string, which is the, the directory name. And in this case, we're returning a Boolean. And it doesn't actually specifically say that that's going to convey uh, an error um, flag. But by convention, that's what we will tend to infer. When we see something returning a Boolean and it's not obviously a predicate, our first reaction is, well, that's the status of it. Uh, so I'm going to allow that as being what we call um, marked propagation. So here's usage code, not surprising at all, just an if statement. I've got a happy path and error card. <coughs> Now, in all of these examples, where I'm only showing one level here, um, it might appear like there's you know, a nice clear separation of the happy path and the error path. But of course, as you start to com compose or nest these, <laughs> that can get very complex and uh, certainly not uh, clearly separated. <laughs> so here's, here's the scores we're going to look at. Uh, the overhead, both for the happy path and the error path, is, is pretty good. I mean, it's quite low overhead. Because we're really just paying for the cost of returning a Boolean and doing an if statement. Can't do that much better than that, or can we? I'll see you later. But I'd say it's, it's not particularly safe. Very easy to forget to check that Boolean and maybe carry on assuming that something's uh, succeeded when it hasn't. Um, and that, that may be quite, quite bad consequences. But as I say, it's quite noisy, because as I say, if you start to nest these things, um, it can really start to look very ugly and most of the code becomes the boiler plate for the error handling. And that's particularly important because, as well as it just making the code harder to read, it also makes you less likely to write the error handling code in the first place. How many times have you seen someone put some code up and say, and I, I didn't put the error handling in to, to make it clearer, to make it easier? Uh, and that's because it's noisy. Separation of parts, you say, once you start nesting this, there's not really any clear separation. You might be able to fake it with some early returns, um, but that's, you can't always do that. I think reasonability is quite good though. As I said, when you look at this, you normally instinctively know that that Boolean is going to convey the error status. So it's fairly easy to reason about. And that's what you need to look for. But because it's using the return value, it gets in the way of composability of the, of the function itself. You can't pass the result of one of these sorts of functions to another. And doesn't convey any extra information beyond the fact that an error occurred, so it has a low message score. <coughs> so that's, that's how we're going to proceed with these. So 
So let's see if we can start fixing some of these things. Uh, I mentioned that safety is poor because we can easily forget to check the boot. The C17, we have something that can help with that. That's the no discard uh, attribute. We put that in. Although the compiler's not required to, um, it almost certainly will warn you at the very least if you don't do something without return value. So if you're going to use this, I would definitely recommend using no discard. <coughs> That helps. It improves the safety. Uh, doesn't really do, do anything else. And then that, that message score. We can, we can easily do something about that just by using a slightly richer type. Even if it's just an integer or an enum. But of course, you could, you, you could return some more complex type there if you wanted to. So um, it increases the message score. But it actually makes it slightly more noisy now. You've actually got a bit more work to do now to, to work with the error handling. So, we're already making trade-offs. It does mean, though, that we can handle a case where what we consider an error differs from what the function considers an error. So in this case, if the directory already exists, we probably don't want to treat that as an error. We probably want to say, well, that, that's fine then. Um, there's other ways to deal with that, but this allows us to do it. One variation that we'll often see is, instead of a return value, we have an out parameter. Typically a reference in C++ could be a pointer uh, as one of the arguments. So now instead of returning it, we're passing it in. Uh, other than that, the usage looks very similar. We do have uh, to, to pre-declare the, uh, the value now and give it a default value. Um, I think that makes it uh, less safe. We can't use no discard now. Um, makes it harder to reason about, I think, because it's less obvious what that means. Um, but it does improve composability because now we're leaving the return path free for composing our functions together. So that's quite nice. Again, we're already seeing more trade-offs. Uh, getting better in some ways, worse than others. We can also mix approaches. And this is something we see quite a lot, actually. Uh, particularly in more sort of C-style uh, APIs. We've got the, um, the Boolean return to tell us whether an error occurred now we can use no discard. But if it did occur, we can use the out parameter to say what the error was. This is quite a common strategy. So it's safer, because we can use no discard. Easier to reason about, for the same reason, but composability suffers again. So, still not perfect. <laughs> so maybe we'll get rid of all of that machinery, and we'll just have an unadorned function, so it's unmarked propagation, and we'll store the error code in a global variable. Because what could possibly go wrong there? <laughs> and you laugh, but people do this. Um, now the garden problems. The first one, quite slightly surprising, is the overhead <coughs> um, increases. So we've got a lower score there. Because on a modern architecture, you're probably not going to use a global variable at home. probably going to be some, some sort of thread local storage. So there could be a cost associated with that. You're going to pay every time you look it up. And you're going to have to do that with every call. So that's not ideal. Um, because it's unmarked, I'll say the safety is way down because you have to actually read the documentation or the implementation of the function to even know that an error may be communicated this way. It's still quite noisy, although it's not as bad. We, we cleaned up the, the function call signature itself, we still got the rest of the mechanics there. It's harder to reason about, of course, because it's unmarked. Uh, but composability, better. Um, I'll put it like a midway score because we can now compose the functions together quite freely. But the error handling itself, you have to think about a bit more if you want to have multiple functions with, with error handling going on. Again, we can mix approaches. So this is actually really common, um, particularly in C code. You've got a, a global or thread local uh, error code, and then the Boolean return just to tell you that an error occurred. So again, improve the safety, but at the cost of composability. <coughs> Reasonability is, is better as well. Um, probably the most widely used error handling strategy we can see, I'd say, these days. So, some years ago we decided none of that was good enough. We could do better, we said. And so we, we came up with exceptions. Trying to solve all of those problems. So it's got to be better. Let's have a look at the same example. First thing, straight out, 
you'll see it's unmarked propagation. There's nothing in that signature that tells you that this may throw an exception. Now these days we do have no except to say that this won't throw an exception, but because that's quite late to the game, it doesn't imply that no except is there, that it, it is intended to throw an exception. So we don't tend to rely on that. So really, we, we, we just have unmarked propagation. So look at the score. We'll come back to the error, code, error path score. Uh, safety is, is not great because of the unmarked propagation. It's not as bad though because we, um, if an exception does occur, we will tend to pick that up fairly quickly at runtime, so hopefully in our testing we'll get good visibility on what went wrong, more so than with the error codes. Um, noise is pretty good, because now we're, we're shuffling all the error handling off, so the separate paths score is perfect. We'd have that clear separation between the happy path within our try-catch there, and all of the error handling in the catch block. And of course, as we know, we know that that catch block may actually be several stack frames down. Doesn't mean you need to be in this function. So all that part is fine. But safety and reasonability are suffering because of that mark propagation. But it's the overhead on the error path that's been hot topic in the more, more recent times. And particularly in certain domains, uh, such as embedded, games, uh, high, high performance computing, particularly in finance. Um, I recently gave a version of this talk at an audio developers conference. It's all about low latency. <coughs> and actually, it's not the, necessarily the raw performance here that's the killer, it's the determinism involved. On average, the performance might actually not be uh, that bad, but it's the, the determinism that's the, that's the problem. Um, and we got into this situation because we were optimizing so much for the happy path exceptions. We were saying we want to treat it as if errors never occur, and if they do, we can just handle them gracefully over here, but at that point, you know, we're already in an exceptional situation, so it doesn't matter so much. It turns out that's not as true as we thought it was. And that there are many, many cases where that just doesn't apply at all. Just for completeness, we just had this problem. So that, that case where um, what's treated as an exception, maybe we don't want to treat as an error. <coughs> Um, in this case, we probably wouldn't handle it this way, but it just shows that that problem does exist. So sometimes we do actually want to, we end up using exceptions for control flow, which is a really bad idea. Don't do that. So about those performance figures. We don't have any um, really reliable across the board figures. Uh, it's actually quite a, a hard problem to solve, but a number of different people have done benchmarks. This one I've stolen from Noel Douglas. Uh, from a talk he did at Meeting C++ last year. Um, and if you can see that there, the yellow bars are the cost of throwing an exception up 10 stack frames on the x64 architecture. All of those things are significant, but it has to be in a, in a context. The, the other bars are different ways of returning errors um, using uh, returns. Doesn't matter what the differences are, they're pretty minor. So, What's interesting is that the y-axis is actually, actually um, exponential. So there's um, two or three orders of magnitude difference in these costs. This is on, on the, the error graph between exceptions and error codes in this particular example. And other benchmarks with different contexts might have slightly different findings, but basically bear the same message out that it's, it's really bad. If this matters, it really matters. It's a problem. So much so that in the 2018 C++ Foundation developer survey, it found that 52%, more than half the C++ developers, reported that exceptions were banned in part or all of their project code. So not necessarily all, but at least in part of their code bases. I did a similar survey, just getting people to put their hand up, when I did that talk at the, the audio developers uh, conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we got a, sort of similar, similar spread, actually more than half, which you would expect in that, with that audience. A lot of people in the C++ community not using exceptions. And the implications goes on to say, 
Most are not allowed to freely use C++'s primary recommended error handling model, an important bit, that's required to use the C++ standard library, so standard language and library. So, more than half of C++ developers are not able to use standard C++, that's the message. That's pretty serious, man. Right? Even if it doesn't necessarily affect you personally, and maybe it does. So we clearly need to rethink this. Go beyond exceptions, what can we do next? And this is an active area of exploration. There's a few things going on in this space now and in the future. What we're we gonna look at next. And I wanna start, so you may have heard of ADT-based error handling. Someone was asking me just before uh, the, the talk if I was gonna talk about this. The answer is obviously yes. What does it mean? ADT stands for Algebraic Data Types. Um, and I think whoever decided this is what we're gonna call it, uh, ADT-based error handling, they're a little bit too general because there's two types of algebraic data types. Product types, can be classes, structs, pairs, people, anything where you have um, <coughs> vendors of different types and you, you consider all of them. So you're considering the products of all their ranges. But the one we're interested in is actually some types. <coughs> so these are things where you have uh, apologies if that's a bit low for some of you at the back. Where you have um, a choice of types. It could just be an optional, where you have a choice of nothing or a value. But it could also be variant, where you have a choice of different values of different types. We're also going to look at a proposed set expected. And there are other types in this family that represent the choice of types. This can all be useful in an error handling context. So, let's look at another example. Uh, so here's sort of a prototypical date class we might start writing. We've got our members there, and we've sort of made an attempt at writing a constructor that will have some sort of contract in there. So we have to uh, always construct it with, uh, with valid, um, valid dates. But maybe we want to construct these from data that's come from some unverified source, reading it from a file or something. We want to do some sort of validation and, and filter out the invalid dates. So we might add some sort of factory function, like this uh, static make method, one way to do it. And if we want to use std optional, we just use that as a return type. So instead of returning a date, we return a std optional update. So you see me most people are familiar with std optional. Um, hopefully it's obvious how we use it, if not. So it's just a simple wrapper type that will either contain the date or nothing at all, and then the ability to query which one of those it is. So now we can do our validation up front at runtime, return an empty optional, oh, there. Uh, if it's not valid, otherwise return the valid date wrapped in the optional. Simple as that. Note that this constitutes marked propagation. It's now visible in the signature that we may or may not return a date. Usage. Again, apologies if it's a bit low for you at the back. Um, we'll obviously call our, our make function. Um, and what we're going to get back is an optional. An optional overloads the, um, the Boolean operator uh, explicitly, so we can do an if on that. If it does contain a value, we can dereference it with pointer like syntax to get the, uh, the, the raw value out. And otherwise, we just know that we didn't get a valid date. So, very similar to the, the Boolean example earlier, uh, except now we're mixing the actual value with the error code in the same channel. Bigger <laughs> 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 So, <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, very similar to the Boolean return, but now we're, we're mixing, mixing all into the return channel. So let's have a look at the, oh, um, just to complete this, if you're going to go down that route, I, I tend to often also expose the, um, the unverified uh, form as well. Um, and I like to make it obvious that's what I'm doing, so I'll, I'll use something like make unchecked. That's a separate thing. So let's um, look at the scorecard. So overhead, again, it's not too bad, comparable to the error returns. Uh, maybe even identical, it's difficult to, to say in the general case. Um, Safety is pretty good because we are forced to, to deal with the option in order to get the value at all. So we really can't, can't forget it. Um, but it's at least as noisy as the error codes. We're going to do extra work. It's all mixed in together. We don't have a separation of paths. Um, it's not as bad in terms of composability because we can actually um, compose these functions together. We just may have to do a bit of extra work to deal with the optionals along the way. We'll dig into that a little bit more later. Um, in this particular case, as I say, it's very much like the Boolean, so no extra information. The, the message score is, is quite low. So, maybe some improvements, but I'm still making trade offs here. So, the next thing we might want to do is address that message score by using some like stood variant. Because now we can introduce not, not just the, um, uh, the actual value, date in this case, but also some type we're going to use for the error. Now, I've used the string here. Uh, just because it's easier to, to put on the slide, but we would probably want to have some sort of custom error type or an exception object or something like that. That's the great thing about variant. We can use any type we want in that second position. So again, I'm assuming everyone is familiar with variant. Um, if not, hopefully it's fairly obvious, but it's, uh, we're going to get back a choice of one of these uh, types, one of these values, and it means to query it, as we'll see in the usage. The typical way that we do that with a variant is we've got this method, uh, sorry, this free function, holds alternative, give it a type. So does it hold this particular type? Down the bottom here. Um, and if it does, we can actually get that type out using std get. So if it holds a date, we can do std get date, we've got our date out. But now, if it doesn't hold the date, we say, well, we must hold a string, so we can do std get a string. Now we've got an error message, or whatever the error type was. So, very similar, but a little bit more verbose. So, here's how I'd score that. Um, I think safety goes down a bit, just simply because there's just so much more um, stuff to go, go wrong here, to get wrong, that things are harder to use. Definitely a lot more noisy, it's very verbose. Uh, the, the error handling code is really getting in the way, even at this level, without even doing any more nesting. No separation of paths still, but we do at least get a better message score. Now we can put anything we want in there. So again, we're trading one thing off for another. But we can we can build on this, we can improve it. For one, there's some alternate ways to get the value out. If we use stood get if, that effectively converts it to an optional. So if it is a date, we'll, we'll get the date out that we can as an optional that we can dereference. Otherwise, we fall back to stood get for the error case. That's a bit cleaner. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll improve the, the noise score a bit. It's, um, it's not making a huge difference, I think. And the big problem with stood variant is it's, it's not really a type that's optimized for use in, in error handling. I would argue it's not even that good at, at being a variant, but that's another topic. <laughs> but certainly in this case, it's definitely getting in the way. It's, it's causing more problems than it solves. <laughs> But the idea is good. If we had some more specialised type for error handling, I think that would improve things. And that's exactly the reason for the proposed stood expected. Is the proposal for it. Um, I think this is still going through. I'm not sure this is on track for C20, but I wasn't following at the last meeting, so I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but it's definitely still in there. And here's how you'd use it. So on the return type, it looks very similar to variant. Again, we can use any two types we want. Again, I wouldn't use stood string, I'm just using it here for exposition. Um, in the usage, though, uh, straight off, we can just go straight to using the, the dereferencing operator um, and the, the, uh, the Boolean operator. So it's much more like stood optional in use. 
except that we now can say uh, dot error in the error case. So really it's just like optional, <coughs> but easier to get the error out. So safer, less noisy, um, but not by much. Again, it's a step in the right direction, but we're not there yet. Still got some work to do, I think. And this is not even standardized yet, so we're starting to already step into the future. You can roll your own for something like this. So many of us have been doing that for years. There's uh, something in uh, Boost called uh, Boost Outcome. That's, it's a bit like this, it's slightly different as well, but uh, it covers the same ground, so you can use something like that. Um, other people have their own uh, polyfill versions as well. So you can use this today, but it sort of represents the bleeding edge of, of C++ right now when it comes to error handling. And you know, we're still a way off perfect scores. Where else can we take this? Well, one of the problems here is, is all of the boilerplate. And a lot of that boilerplate is something that, well, when we see boilerplate in code, we, we like to write abstractions that will hide that boilerplate. <coughs> and we can do something like that. Um, to <coughs> talk about this a bit more, I also want to drill into that composability stuff as well. Right? So if we start to nest things together, it gets um, uh, even noisier. So I want to use some examples that uh, have two functions we're going to compose together. So I'm continuing with uh, we're still expected for now. <coughs> See where that takes us. So we've got a two int function that takes a string, converts it to an integer. Implementation doesn't matter, it's not particularly efficient, but it does a job. And the return is still expected, so it may or may not um, convert it to a string. And if not, gives us a message. And then divide takes two integers, tries to divide them, and of course that may fail if, uh, if the denominator is, uh, is a zero, got to divide by zero. So we're going to treat that as an error. Um, strictly speaking, we would probably treat that more like a contract, but that's sort of a matter. Just an example, so we're turning another still expected. So it would seem like we would want to be able to compose these together to convert a string to an integer and then divide it by another integer. But we've got to deal with that still expected, and that's where the boilerplate comes in. So as is, this is how we might write code using those example functions. The bits that I've highlighted are the happy path. Everything else is boilerplate to do with the error handling. Using the bleeding edge of error handling in C++ right now. So I think you can see where the problem is already. So how are we going to deal with that boilerplate? Well, here's one way. Um, some big words up there. Functional, exceptionalist, error handling with optional and expected. Um, there's monads written in here as well. We're not really going to dig into exactly what that means. This is a blog post from, uh, from Simon Brand from sometime last year. And he was saying that um, types like optional and expected, you can treat them as monads. Um, they just need some extra methods on there to make that happen. And what that actually means in practice is ways to chain these things together. And you gave some, some examples. Um, and it's these and then and uh, map methods that he's talking about. So in, um, so not in San Diego, actually, it was in uh, Rappersville. He actually put it into a proposal. This is going through now, um, maybe on track for C++20, uh, it may not, but basically everything that was in that blog post is trying to standardise, so we may actually get to see this. But even today, we can achieve something very similar by writing our, our own helper functions. So, to make it work the way that Simon was proposing, you need methods. And you'll see why this is a problem in a moment. With a helper function, you can do something similar. Um, now, I apologise for all the... Um, template stuff at the top. We don't really need to dig into that, but all it's doing is it's saying, well, give it a type. If it's already a stood expected, use it as is. Otherwise, wrap it in a stood expected. That's all it's for. And we use that in this with function, which takes a stood expected, all very generic, so very template and a lambda. And what we're going to say is, if our stood expected has a value, that's the, uh, the if there, then dereference it and call our lambda and return the result. 
And that's where the, um, the unexpected bit comes in. If that result is all really unexpected, we'll return it along. Otherwise, we wrap it in unexpected. So this will always return as still expected. Make sense so far? If we didn't have a value to start with, we just return an empty stood expected. We have to rewrap the error because they may be of different types. That's the only reason we do that. But we're just, just forwarding it along. So we're going to sort of carry on forward if we've got no error, or we short circuit if we do. That really just encapsulates the boilerplate that we were looking at before. Okay, so that's all well and good. How does that change the code that we saw? Well, here's what it looks like. Now, just to, to explain this, so the, the highlighted bit is where we start now. So we sort of start in the middle of it with our quarter to int. Um, if that returns a value, um, then we're just going to call the land that we pass in, which is the next thing, with a dereference value. Now, that's one nice thing. We don't have to dereference the value it's, uh, ourselves, so it's a bit safer. If we can't accidentally dereference it at the wrong time. It's all done for us. Um, and we can pass that the reference value onto divide, which itself then returns as expected, and the other width forwards that on to the second lambda, which then does something else with, again, the dereference value. So, yeah, it's sort of slightly better, but I really don't like that either. And this is why I say it really needs to be a method, because by making a helper function, we've had to invert the flow here, and it really doesn't read very well. And there's not really any decent way to even format that that makes it a bit easier. So, let's have a look at the scores anyway. Um, I'd say it's safer. We haven't had to dereference ourselves, but definitely noisier. We do have a separation of paths emerging, though. That's an interesting thing. Now, we still have a bit of boilerplate with the help function, but it's not as much as it was before. Um, and all the error handling is now happening um, at the end, at least in our code. Um, and we're actually using compositions to make it so work, so composability is quite good. So it's actually not bad, but that, that noise score is the one that really bothers me. And I said it's because of this inversion of, of the flow. But there's one thing we can do to improve that already, and that's to use an infix operator instead. If we only make this change, instead of calling this function with, we call it operator pipe, in this case. We could use another one, but it's the traditional one. Now the code looks like this. And I think this is much more readable. The flow is right. We do add to int. If that succeeds, first lambda. If that succeeds, second lambda. Again, the highlighted code is a happy path. We still have a bit of boilerplate there. Think you'll agree, it's a lot, a lot less noisy. Format's a lot nicer. We're definitely getting somewhere. So, do I have scores? Yes. So, it's still, still a bit boilerplate not a perfect scroll with noise. Maybe, maybe we could do better than that. Again, composability, uh, it's the name of the game. But these other scores are actually looking pretty good. If you, if you forget for the moment that there's still a bit of boilerplate, it's not that bad. Can we do better? Now I did say, without going into the details, that this all works because we're treating expected here, which is the same with optional as a monad. Now I invoke the n-word, we might be thinking, well, you know, what do functional languages do with this then? Because they're all about the monads. You know, so they're bread and butter. Well, they must have ways to deal with this to make it a bit nicer. So let's go all the way to the top. Have a look at Haskell, which of course does deal with monads all the time. And it has this thing called do notation. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's an example from the Haskell wiki. It says it's syntactic sugar for use with monadic operations, or expressions rather. And it's got this syntax. It'll take a bit of explaining because there's a couple of things that are very different to C. The, the do keyword itself does to do with doing C. This just introduces this block. Uh, it says do some magic things with it. And then the semicolons in here, not the same as the semicolons in C++. You may have heard uh, people use the term programmable semicolons. That's these ones. They're programmable, 
in the sense that what they do is they map to these operators down here, which are basically the same as what we're using our pipe operator, pipe operator for. That's where the magic happens, that, the boilerplate stuff that does all the in-between uh, handling. So what he's saying is rewrite that comparative looking sequence of expressions or statements into something with all of that um, binding stuff going on. Which is exactly what we want, really. We want to get rid of that remaining boilerplate. We had something like this <coughs> in C++. What might it look like? Let's do a bit of a thought experiment, shall we? So here's the example we were looking at, as, as it was before. Now, let's set aside for a moment the different meanings that these things have. Let's put that those sort of Haskell-like um, do notation in there. So we've got do keyword, we've got these semicolons with the Haskell meanings. Let's uh, first of all get rid of those semicolons. And because we're doing error handling, let's replace it with this try keyword. Basically it means the same thing. It means treat this expression as something that we're going to bind to the next block of code. We're going to treat it as a lambda. So all we've done here is a mechanical translation from this back to the, the thing that we had we stood expected of the lambdas. Okay. Now these semicolons we've got here are the C++ ones, we've we'll got those back. Um, I didn't like the fact that um, some of the happy path was actually still down the bottom here. We could move that up into the, to the do block as well. Um, and at the same time, we can move the, the error path into a lambda that we're going to pass to a method on the thing that do returns. So do return something that holds the error object that we have on. If it does, it's going to call this method catch and pass it to the lambda you pass in. So it's called catch because now it looks like a catch block. Okay? Taking this one step at a time. May as well make that do a try then. Now obviously this means something different to try that we use today. Even though it looks like it's in the same position. So it's obviously going to be a contextual keyword. We need to somehow differentiate whether it should have this meaning or its meaning today. We'll get to that, put it aside for a moment. Taking this step at a time. Looking at the, um, uh, the code that we call, which currently returns as still expected. If we just say froze there instead, that's a signal to the compiler, again, to translate that back to, instead of returning a double, return a still expected a double on some standard error object. Again, mechanical translation. We just rewrite it, effectively. Syntactic sugar. And instead of returning a stood make, uh, stood make unexpected, again, contextual keyword throw uh, with some error code means stood, return make stood unexpected or that. Okay, one to one correspondence. This contextual keyword throw here. Now we've got the thing that makes it contextual, the froze keyword on the function. When the function has a froze keyword on it, it means that throw and try have these new meanings. You might be wondering why we're overloading the terms, but hopefully that'll become clear. If we're doing that, let's clean up that catch block as well and make that complete. Now we have try and catch and throw with new meanings, only available when a function has that's marked as froze. So it looks like exceptions that we have today, but they're not, because we just saw this traces back to the equivalent of returning um, still expected or something very much, very much like it. It's actually slightly different, but the difference isn't too important right now. Which means it has different scores. It also means we have marked propagation here. It's a big difference. We have the froze keyword. That tells us in the signature that this will throw whatever this thing is. It's not an exception. An error, if you like. Um, we also have the try keyword uh, here before the expressions that may throw. Strictly speaking, at this point, we, we don't need it. The compiler doesn't need it. But by having it there, 
that the compiler can enforce. It can say, well, you need a trying keyword here. That now documents in the code any line that may change the control flow. We've made that control flow visible again. Big problem with exceptions is the control flow became visible for the unmarked propagation and the, uh, the throwing pool sites. So that's an improvement. But now look at these scores. <laughs> Again, maybe may you might quibble with some of them. But the overhead is at least as good as the so expected still optional case, at least as good as the error codes case, may even be better. In fact, there may be a case that we'll, we'll see to make this perfect score. Because the compiler now knows about this mechanism, it can actually optimize it more aggressively. For example, on the, um, on the return channel, when the assembler regenerates, there's a, a bit in one of the registers that it can actually use to indicate whether an error occurred. So there's basically no cost to that. And down at the, uh, the call site, that if statement that's effectively going to be there, um, that can be um, done in such a way that the branch predictor will almost always take the right path. Assuming we can continue to have branch predictors, but that's another question. Um, so we may get to get this to a perfect score, though. We almost don't pay for the error handling at all, even in the error path. And the rest of the scores are pretty close to perfect as well. Not to point off of the noise, because obviously we still have to put some keywords there. Not everyone likes that try keyword, but I think it's worth the cost. Um, but it's definitely a case for this being about as good as it can get. And it's not just a thought experiment. There is a very real proposal behind this. It's got Herbsutter's name on it, a lot of people behind it, including Noel Douglas, I mentioned earlier. Um, definitely not going to be in C20. It hasn't even hit the, the evolution of working groups yet. It may go nowhere, but there's a lot of interest in this. Um, particularly amongst those communities that are currently not using exceptions at all or, or in limited amounts. But even beyond that, everyone that hears about this seems to really love the idea, except for a few people whose minds seem to be set up in such a way that they always find <laughs> all the potential problems. We'll sort those out. I think this definitely has a huge channel. Um, just to, to <coughs> summarise, because there are some bits I didn't really cover, the reason this works is because it throws values effectively. Rather than exceptions that we have now, they throw objects which have to be allocated on the heap uh, and then use RTTI uh, to, uh, to do the, the pattern matching on them. Throws values and no heap allocation. Uh, unlike the ADT based error handling, we can also throw from constructors and operators. So it's, it's not actually a, a literal one to one correspondence. Um, the value is no more than two pointers in size, and this is why it can be so efficient, uh, because it can fit in registers. Uh, it also means that we can potentially um, carry a, an arbitrary payload, because you can put a pointer in there or something. If you need to have that done on the go there, you can still opt into it. Um, and static expressions says can interoperate with dynamic expressions, exceptions, sorry. So you can actually mix and match. If one of these functions marked throws calls a function using traditional exceptions, it will get um, translated and vice versa. So you may actually end up in a situation where things get mapped between static exceptions, dynamic exceptions, static exceptions, and all the way down, which doesn't sound ideal and it's not, but it's not that, actually that much worse than what we have today and has potential upside. So I think that's, that's the right model. There's plenty more, it's actually quite a long paper. If you're interested, I recommend you read it. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it over the next few years. Unfortunately, it's going to take a while to, to brew. But I'm really excited about this. Um, that's mostly the end of this talk. How many, how many minutes do I have left? OK. I'll just mention briefly, there's, there's actually a few other proposals associated with this that it, um, that it builds on. One of them is for the standardized error code that would be part of this. Um, called uh, stood error, uh, it's sort of built on, on top of um, system error that we have now, solves a few problems with that. 
Um, and also this attribute, move relocate, um, it's somewhat related to the idea of destructive move, but it's more about being able to, uh, we have currently um, trivially copyable, where we can say copying something is the equivalent of mem copying. This is the same thing but for move. Um, Close related to that is object relocation in terms of move plus destroy. It's basically the same thing with a different name, um, but it's closer to destructive move. One of those two would need to go in to realize all of the optimization benefits that we talked about. To get those perfect tens, we need those. It's still worthwhile without them, but it's better with. Um, I think that really is it. So, before I finish, I'll just point out that I've got loads of references for this, including all of the proposal links and loads more, uh, about 37 references, I think, on my website, levelofindirection.com. If you can't remember that, also got extra levelofindirection.com that redirects there. <laughs> I recently registered another levelofindirection.com and too many levels of indirection.com. I'm going to stop there. Uh, forward slash refs, forward slash cpp dash optional dot html. So, just one link for you to, to remember. Um, otherwise, you can find me on Twitter, Phil underscore Nash. That's it. Thank you. Right, so uh, I think you're pointing out that I, I gave it a perfect score for message, even though I then went on to say that it's an, an error code. Um, but I also mentioned, because I obviously glossed over this a bit, it's um, uh, two words in size. So the first word will be the error code. And then depending on the error code, uh, there may also be an additional payload which can be a pointer to anything. So you, you can put any sort of arbitrary data in there if you want to. But you, you only pay for the dynamic cost of that if you need it. Most of the time you don't. But most of the time you do only need to know whether something failed or not and potentially a message on along with it. So, yeah. It covers you, but it's optimised more for uh, simple values. Uh, yeah, is the exception, um, the, the performance issue of exceptions just due to the heap allocation? Or to is the cost of exceptions just due to allocation? Yeah. Is the question. Uh, no, actually. Um, and it varies because the implementation of exceptions is not um, completely specified. There's a <laughs> number of different strategies. Uh, most of the current implementation has used this table based um, form where um, on the happy path, the, the reason the happy path is so good is because there's no no code there to actually allow for it, other than all of the unwind code generally written to the end of the executable image, um, or, or at least some other part. Which means that if an error does occur, um, you've then got to branch out to some other code that will then read this table data in at the end, and then go back and unwind things. And because it's at the end, if you haven't hit an error before, that may not even be loaded into memory. It's certainly not going to be in the cache. So you've got all the cache misses, potentially loading stuff into memory. So the cost can be almost arbitrary um, in size. But you, you always will pay for the dynamic allocation. I say always, I think the, one of the Microsoft implementations does try to deal with the stack, but it's not the real stack because it can have, you can have multiple exceptions in flight at once. So you can't just have one object. It's, it's really weird. <laughs> Whichever way you look at it, um, you, you pay all these extra costs that uh, most people, people designing it didn't worry about because we're not optimizing for that part. Um, and plus the RTTI uh, cost as well. The, the, the two things that people that are sensitive to uh, performance and determinism switch off, exceptions um, and RTTI uh, for that reason. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, middle in the front. Yeah, uh, you have named several uh, options now for the exception M, and, uh, uh, but we are not in C++ range yet, it's not, it's not known where they make it in C++ 20. 
but we have to go now and for instance the heat embedded uh, it lags behind usually for uh, mobile support and so it may maybe the past in twenty two or so. So what would be your suggestion now for for now what should we use uh, on our daily basis that would be easily portable to do that further to see what how twenty or so so I'm trying to summarise that. Um, as uh, the future looks potentially good, but what can we do right now, especially in uh, domains like embedded, where we really have to deal with this? That, that's why I'm trying to give you the sort of progression from where we are today, what we can we can do with a bit of help, uh, and then where we may go beyond that. So right now, I'd recommend, um, I mean, exceptions if you can, because they are the most natural fit for the language, <laughs> they're, and they're what the standard library requires. Uh, but where you can't afford the cost, uh, for whatever reason, um, or you want a slightly different way of controlling the flow, then I'd say probably ADT based, using either optional or still expected or something like it, like boost optional, uh, sorry, boost outcome, mm -hmm. um, depending on what your needs. So what about this uh, helper function that you mentioned? So the, the helper function that I mentioned, um, I mean, that code that I put on the slide, it, it looked a bit scary, but that was it. That was the entirety of the code. It's easy to, easy to write that. Um, you can also, in Simon Brand's uh, blog post, um, he's got a link to his GitHub repo where he has versions of optional and expected uh, that have those methods already built in. You don't even have to use the, uh, the pipe operator. Um, you can use that today. Other people have done similar. Um, you can fairly easily get hold of. Uh, existing versions. Obviously, because these are vocabulary types, it's uh, it's a shame if we have to mix in third-party libraries because they're not going to interoperate. But I think that's the best we can do at the moment. But so you use exceptions where you can because that's going to give you the easiest time. Okay, and on the end. Uh, yeah, so do you think that we really need this new syntax? So one of the reasons why you have that in Haskell is you can have side effects on these blocks because otherwise the language is pure. Um, and don't you think that something like the question mark they have in Rust would be more suitable, which just says unpack this, or in, or in other cases just uh, create a block that is proper for us to exit and propagate the error? I'll try and summarize that. <laughs> uh, do we really need the, the do syntax from, from Haskell, which obviously I'm acting to try? but it's still the same thing under the hood. Um, and I would say yes, because I think what you been willing to say about um, that being there for uh, being able to uh, give you side effects in an otherwise pure language, that's almost like a side effect. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's what um, monads are mostly used for in, in Haskell, but it's not the only thing. Um, monads are just a pattern that you can use for various things. And in this case, it's not about side effects, it's about control flow. And it's about um, short-circuiting the happy path in the case of an error, uh, almost invisibly to, to the happy path code. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what we're using it for here. Um, if, you want, if you want a more generic mechanism, this is one of the reasons that coroutines is being held up at the moment, because you can also use coroutines as a, um, a general purpose monadic um, not interface, but uh, driver, I suppose, uh, engine, which is a bit of an abuse, I think. It's not really been designed for that, and that's why there's the two scores of fault. So if you, you, you can take the, the idea of monads too far in a language that's not really been designed to support them in a first-class way like Haskell. I think the right approach in C++ is to look at these monadic <coughs> patterns and see, and how does this work in this case? How does it work in that case? So keep some of the co-routines, narrow handling, separate, and design them into the language that are well on their own merits. Um, and we're, we're never going to be a pure language in C++. So I don't think that part of it really comes in. So we don't, maybe we do need a general purpose uh, nomad uh, library. Uh, that's a separate, separate question. We can talk about it more afterwards yeah. if you want to. <laughs> Yeah. And you have this uh, throw state and block keyword after the function definition of 
the row keyword. Sorry, 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 again. The throw keyword, part of the function. <coughs> the throws keyword, yes. Yeah. So does that mean like it's an implicit try, so I can use tries uh, or try keyword inside of that function? Uh, so, so this one. Yeah, right. So can I yeah. now use inside the function? Can I use the try from down below? Yeah, so obviously I didn't um, show it all here, but um, the implication was that the, the try and catch here, which mean different things to try and catch today, they only had those different meanings if they were in a function uh, with the froze keyword annotating it. So that actually changes the meaning of those keywords in the function. Okay, so I think that's the answer to this Ross question, where you have the question mark. Yeah. That's basically that. Um, yeah, but then you don't need, so if you have the question mark, you don't need to block the wrong. <laughs> Yeah, but um, you can only use a question mark if you're in a function, or if I know it, you can only use a question mark if you're in a function that also, uh, that also um, returns an um, um, option, what is it called? Option? Error type. Error type, error type, error type. So if you're in the divide function, you can also use a try keyword without the function. Yes, the functions are mechanism built into the language that everyone knows to introduce scopes. This would be yet another way to introduce scopes. I think that's what he wants to ask. So why should we have yet another way if functions alone will do the job? Right. There is another side to it as well, which um, we've never really got into, which is um, here we are, um, what we're seeing is a good thing, this separation of the error path and the happy path giving it a good score, but actually that's not necessarily always what you want. Sometimes you do want to say, at the point of the call, did it succeed or not? And immediately make a um, the choice of that point. And of course you can still do that with try and catch, but it's a lot more syntax. And so some people have asked for a way to deal with it as the stood expected or stood error or whatever it is, at the point of the call. And that's not currently in the proposal. Although you can do that with a wrapper function uh, fairly easily. And then that may be more closely aligned with what you're talking about, although a different mechanism. There's like one way that you can, or that I know that people do this right now, which is there's a well-defined uh, status return, and there is never an out, there's never an out return value, but always out parameters, and you can have a very cheap status, of course, if it's a successful one, and then you can have dynamically allocate the error messages. So that's the, you can do that right now, and then a lot, what you will see many times is there's a macro afterwards, it's going to be, if it is okay, then otherwise return. And that way, you can, like, a good example where you can see an open source program, I'm not sure if they do the um, expensive error object is RoxDB, which works without exceptions with an RTGI, most of the cases. Right. And you can get by, but you need some kind of macro most of the time, because otherwise you're going to be writing a lot of code. It's going to be if, okay, then, otherwise. Unfortunately, I'm only passingly familiar with, with how this works in Rust, so I can't... Uh, and C++. Oh, with C++, right. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, in fact, if you use post outcome, that, that is effectively this in a library. Uh, in fact, the proposal does say this is sort of the, the language version of boost outcome. Uh, or what you could do without the restrictions of the language today. Uh, and that does use macros to, to do the control flow for you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, so I like the idea that uh, do actually has it has to has to do with some side effects, and uh, on that point, isn't that more suitable to get the idea of either, like to actually has a pair containing the uh, result of calculation and the error message, and then just pass it in uh, some kind of lambda, and then pass the calculations in such a manner. So you're talking about either, yeah. which is pretty much what expected is. Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's an either where you are specifically considering the, the second type to be an error type, but otherwise it's, that's exactly what it is. Um, and what I showed before this, this mapped onto, I think is what you were go back to, is what you were talking about. So we have we have the lambdas uh, being sequenced, and the mnemonic part is a bit that's unwrapping and rewrapping. <coughs> yes, over here. Sorry, uh, in case this was already asked, I was have to stay away. Um, for all these code bases, 52% you mentioned in the beginning, which don't use the today's exceptions, yes. see, how do you propose an easy way of allowing the new type of exceptions but still forbidding the old type of exceptions? <coughs> 
So that's a slightly different to what was asked before. You're asking um, how uh, legacy code bases, as they will be, what we're currently writing today, and we're writing new legacy code all the time, um, how they will improve and to operate with the, the new world if we get uh, static exceptions. Um, but I did touch on that, that um, it is defined to, to map between them. Uh, so if a function that's marked throw is called a function that isn't marked throw, as an, ex an exception occurs, the, the exception object will get wrapped in an exception pointer uh, and put in the, the second part of the, the still error. Yeah, but you will still pay the performance over as it will be forbidden in a code base. So how do you, uh, if you don't want right. to do very, very fast code reviews, how do you forbid it mechanically, <coughs> like on a compiler level? So if you, if you compile the code with um, F9 exceptions or whatever the flag is on your compiler, uh, so you have no dynamic exceptions, you'll still have static, static exceptions. So that, that flag you propose would do the same thing as it does today, but it would allow you that. Yeah, and also, uh, when you have a throws keyword in a function, that's implicitly no accept as well, uh, which makes sense if you think about it. Yes? You yeah. mentioned that it's obvious a few times. So the question was basically what's the difference between boost outcome and still expected because Carl Douglas has actually been involved in both. Um, something I've asked Nile a few times and I've always followed exactly what he said when he said it and then I forget. But <laughs> mostly it comes down to, mostly comes down to the um, performance trade-offs. Uh, boost outcome is trying to do what, what we're doing here and give a boil away to the minimal possible overhead, if any, uh, in practice. Um, so that you know, the types are uh, strictly you know, two words in size and um, arranged in such a way that the compiler can optimize it to use this uh, flag in the register, uh, which is why this is all fed into the, the proposal as well, because it's been involved in that too. Um, well, the other difference is that boost outcome uh, does still have exceptions. So if you, if you call a function that returns a, a boost outcome error, uh, and you choose not to handle it using boost outcomes mechanism, um, then you can actually get an exception from it. So you can mix the two worlds that way. Uh, he, he does say exceptions are at the heart of boost outcome, which is different to stood expected because it's meant to be used instead of exceptions. So they're very similar in some ways and completely opposite in others. Uh, there's some other nuance there that I can never quite remember though, so. It's a good question for for Nile himself. If you so, what do I recommend now? We did cover that earlier. And I, I would say, um, if your boost outcome's a good choice. There are some um, costs to using that, not necessarily performance costs, but cost in that. You now you've got a dependency on boost. If you didn't have that before. That may not be the best choice. Um, you're also going to have to use a lot of macros. You're going to use macros for control flow. Um, these are all things you're going to have to consider. If you're happy with all that, I think it's a, it's a great library. Um, but I would much prefer to get the, uh, the language version. Um, but alternatively, as I said, if you, can, if you can afford the cost and the other downsides, um, current dynamic exceptions are still a good choice because they, they're a natural fit for the language in the library today. Uh, and otherwise, we have error codes, we have uh, split optional, we may have still expected, you can get um, versions on, on GitHub already. So it's a case of weighing up what's going to be best for your code base, which is why I try to arrange this as you know, weighing up what the trade-offs are, to at least get you thinking about them. You may make different choices to, to, to me, but I think these are the lines we need to be thinking of, which trade-offs we want to make in this particular case. So there's not one size fits all answer, I think is the answer, I'm afraid. Do we have time for any more? Do we have any more? Yeah, address? Um, so uh, I've heard that um, this uh, study exceptions was also proposed for standardization in C. Do you know what the status is on that? Okay, so the question was, you heard that this has been suggested for proposal in C. Um, it's not strictly true, but um, what is true is that um, 
the static exceptions proposal implies a particular uh, ABI um, because of the way it in interacts with the, the return channel. And that's something that could be made visible to C. So C can have its own mechanism. Um, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I know it's been actively discussed. That is interoperable with this, such that you could throw an exception, a new type of exception from C++, and propagate it through and catch it in C, vice versa. Um, so I don't know exactly what that looks like, but it's something that um, the C community, at least as far as I've heard, are, are being surprisingly receptive to. Um, <laughs> Because actually it addresses all of their usual concerns um, in a way that actually moves the language forward and interoperates with C++. So you know, what's not to like? Uh, but I don't have any more details because it's not very high level. Let us know that it's definitely moving forward and it's quite an exciting idea. Any more? Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for listening.